Okay, we're back. We have a kind of a clean screen over here now. And so let's actually uh, see what, uh, see one of the implications of this theorem here about uh, compact sets being closed and bounded. Let's uh, do another theorem. So this theorem is going to say that if S is a compact set in RL and if S maps S into, we could use the reals, but let's let it be RM. And again, I'm using L and M because I'm probably going to be using N as a subscript on the sequences, so we don't want to get confused there. So uh, we have a set that's compact, and we have a function that is continuous. then the conclusion is that the range of F is also compact. We actually, we actually say that continuous functions preserve compactness. That is, a continuous function takes a compact set in one space and maps it into a set that will be compact in the target space. And so that's a, a simple way of remembering the theorem. Continuous functions actually preserve a number of other properties too. I don't know if we've seen any up till now, but we will see some. Uh, continuous functions preserve compactness. They take compact sets to compact sets. Let's see if we can prove this. What do you think? Uh, are we gonna be able to do this? So we want to prove that this set, subset of the tar whoops, a subset of the target space in RM, we want to show that's compact. And since we're in Euclidean spaces, that's the same as being closed and bounded. But it's going to turn out, and by the way, this is one of the benefits of knowing that compact sets are the ones that have the bolzano weierstrass property. It's going to turn out to be easier to prove this by using the bolzano weierstrass property of the set than it is to use the closed and bounded part. Now, of course, we could do it with closed and bounded by basically, in effect, reproducing the proof that we just gave that a closed and bounded set's compact and then going ahead with the bolzano weierstrass property, but this is more straightforward. So what do we have to do? We want to prove this is compact. That means we want to prove it has the bolzano weierstrass property, and that means that we need to be able to take an arbitrary sequence in this set here, f of s, the, uh, the, the image of s under f, the range of f, we need to take an arbitrary sequence there and show that it has a subsequence that converges to a point in the set. So we'll say, let, since this is in the target space, I'm going to say let yn be a sequence in f of s, that should be. So let's fix that. <laughs> I'm going to fix more. Let this be in f of s. We need to show that this sequence has a subsequence that converges to a point in f of s. So what we will do is we will say, uh, For each natural number, for each term of the sequence, let xn be an element of the pre-image of the singleton set yn. In other words, xn is in S and f of xn equals yn. 
That's what it really means to say xn is in the pre-image of uh, the singleton set yn. So now we have, for every n, we have a, a, uh, an element of s, and so that's a sequence in s. s is compact. So this sequence in s has a convergent subsequence that converges to a point in s. So we can say uh, s is compact. So xn has a subsequence write that as x in k has a subsequence which of course is entirely in s has a subsequence um, that uh, let's just say such that so we can uh, shorten this a little bit subsequence such that the subsequence converges to some x bar in S. All right, so I don't mean that it converges to an x bar that we already know. The subsequence converges to some point. We're going to call it x bar, and it's in S. We know that it, we have a subsequence that converges to a point in S because S is compact. X bar is an S, but then it's the case that we have, um, since F is continuous, uh, then uh, it's the case that the sequence of images here converges to f of x bar, which uh, we will call, well, let's just leave it at that, f of x bar. So this sequence, the subsequence of the original sequence, this sequence converges to f of x bar because f is continuous, right? But f of x bar is a point in uh, the set S. So what we've done is we've taken an arbitrary sequence in f of s, and we have, by working back through s, which is compact, we have constructed a sequence and subsequence in s and a corresponding subsequence back in f of s that converges to f of x bar uh, Oh, and this is not right, so let's, uh, we need to fix this. This is not right. It converges to f of x bar, and let's write over here. Uh, and since x bar itself is in s, we have f of x bar is in f of s. And we could call that y bar, if we like, but it's not really necessary. So we could say f of x bar is a point y bar, which is in f of s, because x bar is in s. And so uh, that's the, uh, that finishes the proof, because we have started with an arbitrary sequence in f of s, and we've constructed a, um, a subsequence that converges to a point in f of s as well. So f of s is compact. So a uh, simple proof uh, of a powerful theorem, in fact. So let's uh, do one more theorem, I believe. And uh, I think for that we will take off the proof of this theorem. Uh, but we'll keep the theorem on the screen so that we have it to refer to. So we'll take off this proof and then I'll be right back, okay? Okay, so let's uh, do another theorem here that uh, follows from the theorem here, and this is going to be the famous Weierstrass theorem that we've already mentioned 
more than once in the course. They even used it once, I'm not sure, without having proved it. So the Weierstrass theorem says uh, if S, a subset of RL, is compact and F from S into R is continuous. I'll just abbreviate this this way. Then F attains a maximum on the set S. In fact, let's say IE, there exists an X bar in S such that for all X in S, F of X is less than or equal to F of X bar, which I think we've already uh, seen once before as the, the notion of a maximizer, X bar being a maximizer of F. So the first thing to note is that this theorem, unlike the theorems that we've done up till now today, where we may or may not have actually had the target space being R, um, or the sets might have been in R, but they were typically, I think, in Euclidean space. So it was larger dimension than one. So here we were in a Euclidean space, RL, for the target space. Oh, well, sorry, the target space was here, RM. Here, this only makes sense if the target space is R because we're talking about having a maximum. So here, the fact that the target space is the real numbers is a central part of the Weierstrass theorem. So we have a real valued, so I'll put that here. So what we have is a real valued function defined on a compact set. And in fact, I could have, and so you often see the Weierstrass theorem written that way. If f is a continuous real valued function defined on a compact set, then f attains a maximum. So let's uh, see if we can come up with a proof of this uh, theorem. Well, from the theorem above here, where we had the same exact situation, but the target space was a larger dimensional, well, potentially larger, M could be one. In fact, let's take the theorem above, let M be one, then the theorem here fits exactly into the situation up here. Um, and we would say then that F of S is a compact set, and now it would be a compact subset of R. So, let's put that here, by the above theorem, F of S is a compact set or a compact subset of the real numbers. Therefore, it has a least upper bound. Let's call that least upper bound uh, Y bar. And uh, let's not quite say this yet. We're getting, jumping just a little bit ahead of ourselves. So, F of S is a compact subset of the reals. And in particular, that means it's a bounded subset because compact sets are closed and bounded. So it's a bounded set. Therefore, it has a least upper bound. Call that least upper bound Y bar. And again, I'm using Y bar because we often use Ys for the uh, elements of the images of a function in the target space and X's for the things in the domain. 
So it has a least upper bound, say y bar. And since f of s is not only bounded, but it's also closed because by the above theorem, f of s is a compact subset of R, so it's bounded. We just use the fact it's bounded to get the least upper bound. And now I'm using the fact that it's closed to say that the least upper bound, y bar, has to be in s. So since this is the case, we have y bar in f of s. And so, therefore, it's the case that uh, well, in fact, let's let let's let's say well, we've got kind of a lot of residue on here. I don't know if that shows up, but it shows up to me. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's say let x bar in S be an element such that f of x bar equals y bar. That is, x bar is in the pre-image of y bar. So since y bar is in f of s, there has to be an x bar, at least one, in s that gets mapped to y bar. And so we have for every x in s, we have f of x is in f of s. And y bar is the least upper bound, so that means that for every x in s, f of x is less than or equal to y bar, because that's the least upper bound, or it's an upper bound, that's good enough, of f of s. And y bar is equal to f of x bar. So, in fact, x bar is exactly uh, the, fits the definition of being a maximizer of f on s. It is the case that for every x in s, f of x is less than or equal to f of x bar. So that's it. Simple proof. In fact, each of the three proofs that we've given here, once we had uh, developed the idea of the bolzano weierstrass property and then the idea that compact sets, sets that have that property, are the closed and bounded sets, then everything kind of goes through pretty easily. In fact, we didn't really need uh, the fact that the compact sets are closed and bounded. Everything we've done basically uses the, the notion of bolzano weierstrass property. That's not entirely true, because down here in the Weierstrass theorem, I actually did use the fact that the compact sets are both bounded and closed. And actually, I think I used them in this theorem too, so I kind of got ahead of myself there. So now we actually have the Weierstrass theorem, which is a central theorem, and it's probably the, uh, the most important feature of compact sets. You recall this lecture is about compact sets, and so this is a property of compact sets that continuous functions preserve compactness. So I guess you could say it's also a property of continuous functions as well. Uh, and this is probably the most important property or feature of compact sets. At least it's the most important property for economics. Because in economics, we're always talking about, we're always modeling um, individual decision-making units, consumers, firms, um, individuals, uh, as maximizing or minimizing some objective function. That's just how we model individual choice behavior in economics. And so since we're modeling decision makers as maximizing or minimizing, and of course everything works here the same for, for minimization as for maximization, since we're modeling decision makers as maximizing or minimizing some objective function, if we can either assume or show that it's reasonable that the objective function will be continuous in some metric, then uh, it will be the case that the decision maker has 
an optimal decision that we may be able to characterize and do some more with. And that's a lot of what we're going to do in the rest of the course now, is to take these maximizers and find ways to characterize maximizers of functions. And uh, those characterizations of the maximizers then in economics, those will be ways to characterize implications that come from an individual actually choosing uh, according to maximization. So one last thing we want to do, I have said uh, a little earlier in this lecture and probably before that all, maybe as important as the proofs, the proof of a theorem is counterexamples to bring out, to show us why the assumptions that we make in a theorem are needed to get the conclusion, why the theorem is the theorem it is. And so here we have, I would say, uh, three assumptions going on here and here in the theorems. So we, I, I would, I think it's simple to, to organize them as three assumptions. We're assuming that we have a compact set, but in our L, that means two things. The set's closed and the set's bounded. And then we're also assuming that our function is continuous. So there's three features, three assumptions that we're making to get the conclusion that f of s is compact or to get the conclusion that f actually has a maximizer. So let's look at three counterexamples, simple counterexamples, uh, to see that each of those is required. So I'm going to take the, uh, all of what we have on the left side of the screen off and we'll do our counterexamples over here. So let's uh, do a first counterexample, and that is going to be one in which s is equal to, uh, let's say, the half open interval, 0, 1. And let's say f, which goes from s into a r, like here. So, okay, and of course, this is a special case of this because r is rl with l equal 1. So, let's say f of x, we're going to keep this really simple. F of x is the identity function. F of x equals x. So here, this set's not, this set is bounded and f is continuous. So the, what our objective is in a counterexample is to construct an example that satisfies all the assumptions, the conditions of a theorem, except one. And so that's the case here. We have a set that's bounded. We have a function that's continuous but our set S is not closed, and there's only one place, in effect, where it's not closed. So you'll notice here that F of S is S, because this is identity function. So that's also not closed. So we have a counterexample, and it says, we could have a continuous function, we could have a bounded set, but if the set's not closed, f of s will not be closed, not, will not necessarily be closed, so it won't necessarily be compact, and down here, f won't necessarily have a maximizer, and of course you can see that on this set, f does not have a maximizer, because it seems like one would be the element of s that maximizes f, but one's not in s. So f gets the value of f, gets arbitrarily close to 1, but never gets to 1. So every element of s, there is another element of s that gives a larger value of f. There's no maximizer of f. So this is a good counterexample to both of these theorems. A second counterexample, let's say s is uh, r plus. And again, let's let f be the simple identity function. So now we again have a continuous function and now we have a set that is closed but not bounded, the reverse of this. R plus is closed, it's not bounded. What's f of R plus, f of s? f of s again is the same set, again because f of x is the identity function, um, which is not bounded. 
So again, I've got a counterexample that satisfies two of the three assumptions, continuous function, uh, closed set, not a bounded set, the image, the range of f uh, is not bounded, so it's not compact. So in both cases, I should say, not closed, therefore not compact, not bounded, therefore not compact. And again, over here, f has no maximizer because any x in R plus, you can find a bigger x and therefore an x that has a bigger value of f of x. So no maximizer. So it's a counterexample to this theorem as well. Well, it's not a counterexample to the theorem. It's a counterexample for the theorem. Okay, not a counterexample to the theorem. That would say the theorem is false. It's a counterexample for the theorem in the sense that it tells us, uh, it shows us that the assumption that s is bounded is needed to get the conclusion. And a third counterexample, of course, would be a set that's both closed and bounded, that is compact, but the function is not continuous. So let's let s be the closed interval, 0, 1 in R, and let's let f be the function that is x if x is less than 1, and 0 if x equals 1. So now I have a closed and bounded, compact subset of R, but I have a function that's not continuous. It's not continuous at 1. So let's draw a little diagram of this uh, third uh, counterexample. Let's put that here. X. Uh, that's supposed to be a straight line there. And this is supposed to come down to 1. And this would be one over here. And of course the key is that the value of the function at one is down here at zero. And so what we get is that the, the range of the function, the image of the set S here, doesn't include one. So that's going to be just the set from 0 up to 1, but not including 1, which again is not closed, and therefore not compact. So this does serve as a counterexample to, uh, sh to show that we need the assumption of a continuous function in order to get the conclusion, to guarantee the conclusion that uh, the, uh, the range set, f of s, will be compact, because here we do have um, s both closed and bound, s is, is compact. Uh, so, oh, and this is also, of course, a counterexample uh, that shows we need continuity of the, uh, of the function f for the Weierstrass theorem, because uh, here, S does not have a maximizer. We can make F as big as we like so long as we don't try to make it 1, but we can make it as big as we like less than 1, and so no point in S is a maximizer of the function F. So we have here three counterexamples, one for each, no, say one for each, not one to each of the assumptions, one for each of the assumptions, showing that each one of the assumptions is actually uh, critical in order to guarantee the conclusion of, the, of each of the theorems. So that's it for compact sets, for continuous functions, for the bolzano weierstrass property of sets, and for the Weierstrass theorem. So that's it for today, and see you next time.